Battle of Kings Mountain reached American General Horatio Gates. He is said to have exclaimed, great and glorious. And when this news reached General George Washington in the north, he said in his proclamation to the army that it was an important object gained, and quote, a proof of the spirit and resources of the country, end quote. But other commanders had something different to say about this. When British General Charles Cornwallis heard of what had happened, he wrote to an American officer saying, quote, I must now observe that the cruelty exercised on the prisoners taken under Major Ferguson is shocking to humanity. And the hanging poor old Colonel Mills, who was always a fair and open enemy to your cause, was an act of the most savage barbarity." End quote. The cruelty that Cornwallis referenced, um, it could broadly be applied to the general treatment of the Loyalist prisoners that were captured at Kings Mountain, but the mention of Colonel Ambrose Mills points to a specific event, the night of October 14, 1780, one week after the Battle of Kings Mountain, when the Patriot Army and nearly 700 prisoners were gathered here in Rutherford County, North Carolina, at the home of Aaron Biggerstaff. That night, a mass trial was held of the Loyalist prisoners. 36 were sentenced to death and nine were executed. British Major Patrick Ferguson had led over 1,000 Loyalists into battle, 90% of them from the Carolina, and those captured were now the prisoners of their former neighbors. Their loyalty to their king and their country had resulted in death for 225 of them. 123 more had been horribly wounded. And now, a week later, the killing of loyal men continued. The violence that took place on Aaron Biggerstaff's farm was not an isolated incident, but accounts from patriots and loyalists alike paint a bleak picture of the conditions that were faced by the 700 prisoners during their capture and on their march following the Battle of Kings Mountain. A historian Lyman Draper records one account on October 10th, 1780, when Thomas Brandon, a Patriot officer, he noticed a loyalist hiding inside a hollow out tree by the side of the road trying to escape. Brandon drags the man out of his hiding spot into the middle of the road and as Draper records, quote, hacked him to pieces, quote, for attempting his escape. Now, Brandon's attack was not the only incident of violence, but Loyalist prisoner, Lieutenant Anthony Allaire, he noted in his journal that, quote, the whole of the rebels' conduct from the surrender of the party into their hands is incredible to relate. Several loyal militia that were worn out with fatigue and not able to keep up were cut down and trodden to death in the mire." End quote. Now, William Campbell, commanding all the Patriot forces on this campaign, um, he passed a general order on October 11th, stating that, quote, I must request officers of all ranks in the army to endeavor to restrain the disorderly manner of slaughtering and disturbing the prisoners. If it cannot be prevented by moderate measures, such effectual punishment shall be executed upon delinquents as will put a stop to it. Now, the attack on the prisoners was just one example of the lack of discipline in the Patriot Army. Many of these frontiersmen, they felt that their mission was complete, and they no longer saw the need to stay with the army and continue suffering the cold, wet, starving conditions that they have just endured for the past three weeks. On October 14th, Commander William Campbell is going to pass a general order that the entire force, uh, no men, were to be allowed to go home until the prisoners were safely secure away from potential British rescue stating that officers should prevent deserters and, quote, exert themselves in suppressing this abominable practice degrading to the name of soldiers, end quote. But Patriot guards are also going to be described as plundering homes that they pass along the roadside, regardless of the family's loyalty. Campbell wrote, quote, it is with anxiety that I hear the complaints of the inhabitants on account of the plundering parties who issue out of camp and indiscriminately rob both Whig and Tory leaving our friends, I believe, in a worse situation than the enemy would have done." End quote. The destruction left in their wake is a testament to the desperation and hunger of the army. As one patriot, Thomas Young, recorded saying, "...we all came near starving to death. The country was very thinly settled, and provisions could not be had for love or money." End quote. 
it's hard to imagine ourselves in the shoes of the Patriot officers during these days. They had just attacked a part of the British Army and struck an amazing victory. But their army was now dissolving around them as men headed home to care for themselves or for their wounded comrades. On October 13th, General William Campbell passed an, an order that all of the wounded who could not keep up with the army were to be hidden away at friendly homes here in the area until they could recover, that they could then escape faster, or friends could be sent down to help them. The fighters who remained with his army were starving. They were soaked, and they were in no condition to fight against another part of the British army if a rescue of these prisoners was attempted. Numbers of their prisoners had already escaped, and fear began to grow that these men may have been going to attack Patriot homes in vengeance. Or perhaps they had gone to gather some of their friends and come find these Patriot guards. Or even worse, they could bring back the British Army. The Army had been away from the battlefield for days, but morning here at the Biggerstaff Farm on October 14th found them very much still in danger. What follows would be one of the most debated parts of the Kings Mountain Campaign and one of the more controversial events of the American Revolution in the South. On the night of October 13, 1780, the army reached the Loyalist plantation of Aaron and Mary Biggerstaff. Now Aaron, a Loyalist captain in the local militia, would have been mortally wounded at back at the battle, and only Mary and an older man were here at the home to receive this army of thousands of patriots and nearly 700 prisoners. Now the sources don't specify if this man was enslaved here at the Biggerstaff farm or if he was hired help from nearby to assist Mary with keeping up the farm. And over the past week's march, many faces between guards and prisoners had been recognized. There were maybe old friends, there were betrayed family members, and there were those whose crimes against the Patriot cause were their main source of infamy. With daybreak on October 14th, the North Carolina Loyalists were now under jurisdiction of these North Carolina Patriots. And it was decided that a civil court trial needed to take place over these criminals. Lyman Draper's 1880 book, Kings Mountain and Its Heroes, includes the lengthy debate among historians about what happened next and why, including this account from a, quote, Governor Campbell. So he says, quote, a court-martial was ordered and organized to try many of the Tory officers, charged by the officers of North and South Carolina with many offenses, such as murdering unoffending citizens not in arms, and without motive, save the brutal one of destroying human life." End quote. Another account comes from Ensign Robert Campbell, who remembered it as being decided that, quote, the officers on that occasion acted from an honorable motive to do the greatest good in their power for the public service, and to check those enormities so frequently committed in the Carolinas at that time, their distress being almost unequaled in the annals of the American Revolution." End quote. So with North Carolina Patriot officers forming a jury, the Loyalist prisoners were charged with crimes committed outside of what had been deemed the acceptable mode of warfare, with many of their past victims now serving as both the guards as well as the witnesses in this court. Now this hill behind me was the scene of this event, but it looked very different in 1780. This ridge was cleared of trees and brush, save one massive oak, standing tall as a landmark. Two main wagon roads crossed here at the base of this hill to form a well-known crossroads, and on the next hilltop, an easy 500 yards away, was Mary Biggerstaff on her front porch watching all of this event unfold. As the sun set on October 14th, torches made from pine knots were lit to illuminate the space here around the hilltop as a jury was formed, witnesses were called, and the trial commenced. Now, accounts vary slightly on how many men were tried, sentenced, and executed, but they all range around 36 Loyalist men accused and nine prisoners losing their life here at this tree. Now, soldier Adam Sharp, remembered later in his pension application describing this event, he says, quote, After the battle, the principal part of the forces that achieved an important victory 
marched to a place about six miles from Rutherford Courthouse, where the military trial of sundry Tories who had been taken prisoners was held, and nine of them condemned and executed. Another patriot account, uh, William Mitchell, he remembers this event saying, quote, Two or three days after Ferguson's defeat, a general court-martial was held of the principal officers, of which Colonel, Cr uh, Colonel Campbell was the president, for the trial of the most wicked Tories, such as had murdered and burned down houses, and ten of them were convicted, and nine were executed. Now, Patriot accounts are not the only ones to survive from this night, but three Loyalist officers either kept journals or later recalled what happened here at the Biggerstaff Farm. Their details and perspective are important to a better understanding of what took place here. Uh, Anthony Allaire, a former lawyer from New York, recalled in his journal, quote, Saturday, 14th October, 12 field officers were chosen to try the militia prisoners, particularly those who had the most influence in the country. They condemned 30. In the evening, they began to execute Lieutenant Colonel Mills, Captain Wilson, Captain Chitwood, and six others who unfortunately fell a sacrifice to their infamous mock jury. Mills, Wilson, and Chitwood died like Romans. The others were reprieved." End quote. Now Alexander Chesney, another Loyalist officer, is going to later think back and write his, uh, his recollection of this campaign. He's going to say, quote, A mock trial was held and 24 sentenced to death, 10 of whom suffered, before the approach of Tarleton's force obliged them, the Patriot Army, to move on towards the Yadkin." End quote. Now, the most complete account from the Loyalist perspective that we have of this night comes from Oozel Johnson, a, a doctor from New Jersey, who had offered his services and treated both Patriot and Loyalist wounded in the battle's aftermath. He says, quote, 10 o'clock in the morning, their guard paraded and formed a circle. Captain DePeister and the rest of us officers were ordered within the ring. They then proceeded to trying the militiamen for treason. Thirty of them were condemned and bound under the gallows. We were spectators of this disagreeable day's work. At seven o'clock in the evening, they began to execute them. Colonel Mills, Captain Wilson, Captain Chitwood, and six others were hanged for their loyalty to their sovereign. They died like Romans, saying they died for their king and his laws. What increased this melancholy scene was the scene Mrs. Mills take leave of her husband, and two of Chitwood's daughters take leave of their father. The latter were comforted with being told their father was pardoned. They went to our fire, where we had made a shed to keep out the rain. They had scarce set down when news was brought that their father was dead. Here words can scarce describe the melancholy scene the two young ladies swooned away and continued in fits all night. Mrs. Mills, with a young child in her arms, set out all night in the rain with her husband's corpse, and not even a blanket to cover her from the inclemency of the weather." End quote. The condemned loyalists were hanged from this large oak tree in groups of three, and after the ninth man was killed, an event happened which maybe changed the emotions of the crowd and led to the cease of further death, the escape of one Isaac Baldwin. Lieutenant Anthony Allaire writes about this moment. He says, quote, One of the condemned, named Baldwin, at the foot of the gallows, broke through their guards and made his escape. A more detailed version of the story comes from a patriot, William Mitchell. He says, quote, One of them made his escape by getting his raw hide thongs off of his arms and legs and crawling between the feet of the great crowd that came to see them executed. He then rose up and ran, and the guard durst not fire upon him for fear of killing some of their own people." End quote. Now more detail is provided by Lyman Draper, that in who includes the explanation that it was maybe Isaac's younger brother who was amidst that crowd, allowed to come and embrace his brother one final time, and it was while they were embraced, while they were sobbing, the crowd was moved by the emotional scene, it was the younger Baldwin brother who actually cut the ties of Isaac, and they both were able to escape through the feet in the darkness of the crowd into the woods beyond. Now that night was 
not just death and execution, but there was mercy shown. Several of the Loyalist prisoners who were recognized by their friends and comrades in the Patriot ranks, they were vouched for. They were able to explain the situation and allowed to rejoin the Patriot army. Um, one of these comes from um, even Samuel Chambers and James Crawford, two of the kind of notable infamous deserters from the Overmountain Men who had gone to warn Patrick Ferguson of the Overmountain Men's approach. Their colonel, John Severe, was able to advocate on their behalf, and both men were allowed to rejoin Patriot service. Another man, Abram Forney of Lincoln County, North Carolina, is said to have recognized one of his neighbors among the prisoners, and after his friend promised to, quote, never get caught in such a scrape again, end quote, Abram vouched for the man's character, and he was released and rejoined the Patriot Militia. Now, stories like this where old friends are guard and prisoner for nearly a week before seeing and recognizing each other, it just speaks as a testimony to the huge size of the crowd making their way down these narrow trails and now gathering here near the bigger staff farm. It also speaks to how busy, exhausted, and distracted these men were with hunger, fatigue, and worry about British pursuit. So perhaps it was a combination of efforts. Maybe it was the fact that many men are recognizing old friends amidst the prisoners. Maybe it was that moving emotional scene of the Baldwin brothers prior to their escape. But something happened to change the hearts of the men leading the trial, and they ceased for their executions. Three men were actually tied at the tree awaiting their turn, and they were released and sent back into the group of prisoners. Now, according to Isaac Shelby's 1822 pamphlet, it was one of these men who later approached Colonel Shelby in the pre-dawn hours of October 15th and told him that in thanks for sparing his life, he wanted to let Shelby know the British cavalry under the feared Colonel Tarleton were expected to arrive at any hour. Now this news in the early pre-dawn morning of October 15th electrified the army who immediately resumed their march in a pouring rain and did not stop until 10 p.m. that night on October 15th when they crossed the swelling, flooded Catawba River to the relative safety of the McDowell's home at Quaker Meadows. Remaining behind at the Bigger Staff Farm were nine men hanging from a tree, left as a warning to all who passed these crossroads of the price paid for supporting King instead of Congress. Now left with them was a threat that spread fear throughout the Western Carolinas. For the rest of the war, the idea of the Overmountain or Backwater Men would be synonymous not only with fast horses and accurate rifles, but brutality that was not confined to the battlefield. Lord Cornwallis noted this impact, stating that where before thousands of men had gathered in support of the Crown's militia, it is with difficulty, he said, that they could now get but 100, and even those were not likely to fight if attacked. But how should this event and these men be remembered? That question has been asked since the day these events happened. Was this a North Carolina court and jury holding trial over North Carolina criminals? Uh, was this guards murdering their protected prisoners of war? Was this a necessary step to prevent more brutality in the partisan war of the Western Carolinas? Or was this itself a step over the line? To Lord Cornwallis, this was a gross misstep of military protocol, inspiring his letter to the Continental Army to complain of the treatment of the Loyalist prisoners and the execution of Colonel Mills. Now to Continental Army General Smallwood, who received that complaint, it was fair vengeance. Proved so by the list of executed patriots that he replied back to Lord Cornwallis as the reason for such brutality. Now to Paddy Carr, a Georgia Patriot, here on this evening, it was justice. For an enemy that he despised, gazing up at those nine men and stating, quote, would to God every tree in the forest bore such fruit as that, end quote. But to Mary Biggerstaff, 
left here at her home to, to untie and bury these men who had served with her husband, and to Mrs. Mills grieving her husband in the cold rain. This was a way that proved the cost of winning this war had grown too expensive. Now, when Lyman Draper wrote his cornerstone book about this battle in this campaign, he also struggled with how to explain or frame this event. Draper includes justifications and motives from other writers, but notes himself, quote, War, in its mildest form, is so full of horrors that the mind recoils from vindicating any act that can, in the remotest degree, increase its miseries, end quote. We cannot ever fully understand what were the thoughts of those involved here at the Bigger Staff Farm on October 14th, 1780. But this later recollection by Isaac Shelby helps to explain why the waters are so muddy, why this is so hard for us to try and explain and understand. Shelby said, quote, it is impossible to those who have not lived in its midst to conceive of the exasperation which prevails in a civil war. The execution, therefore, of the nine Tories near Gilbert Town will by many persons be considered an act of retaliation unnecessarily cruel. It was believed by those who were on the ground to be both necessary and proper." End quote. And that's where we'll close the book on the bigger staff executions. So I'm Ranger William from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Thank you for joining me here at the site of the Bigger Staff Hanging Tree on the 242nd anniversary to the day of the Bigger Staff trials and executions here in Bostick and Rutherford County, North Carolina. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I hope you learned a little bit more and this answered some of your questions about this later part of the Kings Mountain campaign. And I hope it maybe inspired a few questions more. Thanks for watching. Ambrose Mills, Lieutenant Lafferty, Captain Walter Gilkey, Captain James Chitwood, Captain Grimes, Captain Robert Wilson, John McFall, John Bibby or Biddy, and Augustine Hobbs.